Acts chapter 7. We're going to be looking at quite a lengthy passage this morning, um, focusing on Stephen's speech from verse 1. But an important one nonetheless, as we'll discover. So hopefully you recall last time we were preaching from Acts, looking at Acts chapter 6, obviously the the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, they weren't very happy with Stephen, with what he was doing. So they seized him and they charged him saying that you have violated the law and you've spoken against Moses. And these were the charges and this speech in verse 1 was basically Stephen's response. I'm going to read to you from verse 1 this morning. We can just, ah, fantastic, thank you. Technology is good when it works. We start reading, the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go to the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there and into this land which you are now living. Verse 5. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no children. And God spoke to this effect, that his offering that his offspring, sorry, would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out of worship. They shall come out to worship me in this place. And he gave him a covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. And in the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all the afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh and the king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine all throughout Egypt and Canaan and great affliction. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out for our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob and his father and all the kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt and died, and he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb of Abraham, had brought for the sum of silver from the sons of Homer in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so they would not be kept alive. And this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight and he was brought up for three months in the father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brothers and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended and oppressed the, the he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And the following day he appeared to them as they were quarreling and he tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside saying, who made you the ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight and he drew near to the look. And there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals from your 
from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I have come down to deliver them. And now, come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who has made you ruler and judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. And for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years of the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Repfan and the images you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua, who was disposed to the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favour in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You, will you, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come now, we recognize the, the enormity of this speech, but we also recognize our need for you. So Holy Spirit, help in the preaching of the word, help in the hearing of the word, and Jesus, may you be glorified. It's in your name we ask. Amen. So two weeks ago, we looked at Stephen and what was happening. And this is a very, very important part in the history of the church. You recall that he was dragged before the Sanhedrin and he was given charges, as I said before, about speaking against Moses and speaking against the temple. So the law and the temple. If there's ever two things you don't do, two no-nos to the Jews, it's saying anything bad against the law and against Moses. But this is exactly what happened and this is his response. Now, I confess, as I looked at this, firstly, I thought, how do I tackle it? It's 53 plus verses. It's a long passage. And you read through it. It's incredibly rich in history. It covers a huge amount of Jewish history. It talks about Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Joshua, Solomon. I could go on and on and on talking about this. But it's also thinking about the genre because this was delivered by a man right before he was killed. He was under, as you can see here, in this sort of trial. He was under trial, and yet he could recite this beautiful history. And he wasn't just giving them a history lesson for the fun of it. He was having a point. After this message, it was a turning point in the book of Acts. Because after this message, so enraged were the Sanhedrin, they killed him. They took him out, as we'll see next week. They dragged him outside the town, and they stoned him. And from there persecution ramped up. If you look at the book of Acts, the whole thing shifts. We know that Saul was there, or Paul was there at the time of the execution. And then we see when you read from chapter 8, the, the message of the book of Acts shifts from just being in Jerusalem to going out. And we see that persecution was one of the driving forces of sending the message out. So this is an important message. So I was thinking, how could I approach it? Because I didn't just want to skip over it. Because this is a dying man's last words. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to approach it a bit like art. Sometimes if you get a work of art, you can look at it. You can go right up close and you can stare at every little inch. Notice every brush stroke, every little jot and tittle. If I did that with this passage, we'd be here till Christmas 2025. Instead, I'm going to take a step back. You know, some people, you look at art galleries, they look closer, sometimes they take a step back and they take the whole picture in. This is kind of what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to take a step back and we're going to take this whole speech in, looking at the major points, looking at the big ideas about what was being said. Because the reality is, it's a very important speech. So let's think about the context again. This isn't a lovely art gallery. This was essentially in a court of law. Stephen was being accused of breaking the law and going against the temple. He was under duress. He had to give an account for these accusations made. And remember, they were false accusations as well. They twisted his words. They got the people upset about it enough so that they could arrest him. And you can see this was a court scene. Except as someone pointed out, it's quite interesting. Stephen is the accused, and yet something happens. A flip is switched, or a switch is flipped, depending on how you want to say it. He goes from the accused to the accuser. He goes from the accused to the prosecutor. He starts saying, hey, why are you looking at me? And he starts pointing out his finger to the Sanhedrin, to those who are accusing him. And as you look at this argument, he has three main arguments as you look at his speech. Firstly, he essentially says the activity of God is not limited to one area. He goes through the history, as we'll see, and he says, look, God is not limited just to Jerusalem or just to Israel. Man, God showed up in all these different places. Secondly, he says, the worship of God is not just confined to the temple, not just within the four walls or the confines of the temple. No, you can go worship God acceptably outside the temple. And lastly, the stinging rebuke, he says, he points out historically, time and time again, how the Jews and the Jewish leaders constantly rejected God's representatives, God's prophets, and therefore God himself. And you read that very last part, he talks about it, and he makes it very clear that they rejected God because they rejected Jesus Christ. Now we look at this and we think, how could this be relevant for us? Sadly, we make these mistakes. It's very easy for us to look at this and say, well, this is a court thing. I'm not a Jew. What's this got to do with me? But if we think about it, as we read through this, we'll see that we can make these mistakes as well. But let's have a look at the first one here. The first charge that Stephen was laying was essentially pointing out the truth that the activity of God was not confined to one simple little geographic place. Prior to the temple being destroyed in AD 70, one of the main things the Jews loved was the fact that the Jews were there in the land of Israel. They were there in the promised land. All the people were together. What did you have to do if you wanted to go praise God? You had to go to the temple. You had to go there. It's like the old saying in real estate, location, location, location. All of the Jews were in the promised land. Everything was hunky-dory. Everything was happy. And this is what they were saying. But the damage that was done was simply saying that everyone had to come to that spot. It was damaging in a way because it was saying, you've got to come here to worship God. Only the people in this area are worthy to be worshipping God. They are God's chosen people. And it's a mentality that the Pharisees had and the religious leaders had and a lot of the proud Jews had because they could trace their lineage right back to Abraham. My father's father, my father's father, and so on and so forth, all the way back to Father Abraham. They could trace it back and they were proud of that. But Stephen makes it clear that, hey, God doesn't just operate in that one little area. He operates outside of that. And he uses history to prove it. Firstly, he says in the first couple of verses, he says, well, guys, duh, God appeared to Abraham before he was in the promised land. He called him out. He said, God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, when he was in Haran, before he even got to the promised land. God spoke to him. And then he said even further in the next verse, we looked at um, his son Joseph. He said, even when Joseph was in Egypt, God was with him. God was working. God was powerful in the life of, life of Joseph. It says God rescued him out of his afflictions and gave him favor. 
He's pointing out that God doesn't just stay within the promised land, didn't just stay within Israel. No, he worked in the life of Joseph while he was going through all manner of stuff in Egypt. He points that out. He keeps going about it and he keeps reminding and saying, look, God's miracles are not limited to one area. He keeps saying in verse 31, he says, he reminds him when Abraham was initially called in the wilderness of Sinai, there was a flaming bush. When Moses saw it, he was, he was amazed at the sight and he drew near and there came a voice from the Lord. This is the great I am statement. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Where did he appear? In the wilderness in Sinai. What did Moses do? He trembled and he did not dare to look. What did God say next? God said, take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. What made it holy? Was it the location? Was it the coordinates, you know, the, the different coordinates of where it was? No, it was the truth that that's where God was. So where God chose to be, that's what made it holy. And that's where he showed up. And that's where the miracle was taking place. Verse 36, we, read, we continue reading in Israel's history. Right throughout, after the people left Egypt, and I'm really giving you a crash course in the Israelite history here, but after the people were persecuted, they left Egypt with Moses, God was still operating in the wilderness. For 40 years, he led the people. He didn't just stay in one spot, but he went with them, and he did all the amazing miracles in the wilderness. And this is what Stephen's saying. He's pointing this out again and again. In verse 38, he talks about it again. He talks about the congregation in the wilderness. Again, the angel or the representative of the Lord at Mount Sinai. God gave Moses what to say and Moses told the people. The point is that God's miracle work isn't limited to one area. Since the time of the Jews and all the leaders had basically put all their pride on the location. They had the spot. They were in Jerusalem. They had the temple. This is where God is and nothing else outside of that is important. But Stephen said, Oi, remember your history. God operates where he chooses to. He's not limited to one area. And I was thinking about this and going, well, we too today have this limited, can do, I should say, have this limited idea of God. That God only operates within a certain sphere of our lives or a part of our lives, forgetting that God can do anything. Or that we think maybe God only shows up in certain parts. God's here with us today, but not, not later on. We have this very real habit of doing this. And what does it do? It diminishes who God is. It makes us blind to the work of God. If, if you, throughout your week, if you go looking for the miracles of God, you'll find it. You look up, you see a bird flying, you go, how can that thing fly? Because of physics, because God created it that way. You look at the sunset and you go, how can there be a hundred different shades of red and orange and blue and pink? It's a miracle. The point is we can very easily only put God into a box and say, well, God only operates in this space, whether it be geographically or, or a part of our life. But we need to be reminded, no, God can do anything. He's the God who can do anything. Therefore, he can operate outside of that. And when you start to see that, you start to truly appreciate, man, how awesome is God? You see how amazing he is. And you get rid of this idea of being elite and thinking, well, God only operates with us. Because that was part of the other issue as well. The Jews were very proud. They could trace their lineage back to Abraham. God was only operating within Jerusalem, and yet God worked outside of that space as well. We know that the gospel was for everyone. In Romans 1.16, the, the gospel is the power of salvation for the Jew and also the Greek or the Gentile, the, non, the non-Jew. The point is God is not limited in his power to one area. And that's what Stephen was saying. And that's what we need to be reminded of this morning, that God can work his ways anywhere and everywhere. Let's go back to the next point. The second thing, you recall, remember Stephen, he was being charged against saying something about the temple. And he says, well, look, let's be honest. You can worship God. You don't have to just be in the temple. You don't have to just be in the temple proper in order to worship God. Because you know what he did? He reminded them, hey, remember, before it was solid, It was a tent. It was mobile. It went where the people went. It had nothing to do with the building. Don't get me wrong, the building was nice. I love the building. But it had nothing to do with the building. And he says that over and over. I love it. 
He uses the history to prove his point. It was called a tent in the wilderness. That's the only sort of camping I can get on board with, I think. Camping at a tent in the wilderness. It was a tent that was mobile. It says, Our fathers in turn brought it with Joshua and they disposed the nations that God drove out. So the idea is where people went, God was with them. It wasn't a temple of sand and stone and brick just then. But he continues in other parts. In, in verse 45, he says, basically, this happened right throughout history until the days of David. When David said, I want to build you a temple. And he couldn't, but his son Solomon did. And then the reality is, though, even when Solomon was blessing it, he actually said, look, I know that God of the universe doesn't dwell in a temple made by human hands. He doesn't just stay here, but God chose to dwell there. Actually, if we look at the next part in verse 40, and yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, my heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So he's quoting from Isaiah 66. And later on, Paul makes that point very clear. I think it's in Acts 17 as well. Again, the idea is that you have to have the temple in order to bring acceptable worship to God. God instituted that worship, but the point was that Stephen was saying, look, you're so hung up on the temple, you forgot the fact that it's not the temple, it's not the solid thing, it's the fact that it's the presence of God. And we too can forget this as well. If we think about this, we don't have a temple, we have a church building. And I, as I say to someone, what are you doing on Sunday? Oh, I'm going to church. Even that saying doesn't make sense because you should not go to church. We're going to a church building. But to say we're going to church, people know what we mean. We have to be very careful that we don't uphold a building or relegate the worship of God only acceptable on a Sunday morning between 9 and 10 o'clock, depending on how much I go on for. If this is the only time that it's acceptable worship to God, then again, we're limiting what we can do. Our worship of God can happen Monday through to Saturday. Do all things to the glory of God. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Everything that we can do, we can worship God. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this gathering. I love this building. I love that we as a church are putting money back into this building. But at the end of the day, it's a box that we're meeting in. I joked about meeting outside, but we could easily meet outside at a park, and it's still church. Why? Because it's the people. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We are the church, not the building. I like the building when it's hot because we come inside in a nice air con, but we don't need this building. We are the church itself. And so we can get so caught up because we think, okay, I'm just going to come to church to worship God. No, we can worship God wherever we are. One of the best ways we can do that is by having fellowship with each other, by listening to each other, by praying for one another. Because in doing that, we're loving each other. And by loving each other, we're obedient to God. One of the best ways that we should worship God is with obedience to Him. You think about the Jews. They made people come to the temple. Come to the temple. This is what was ordained and then through God, and then they added the extra restraints through man, as, as they often did with regards to the law. But the emphasis was, come to the temple, then you can worship God. But the reality was, if you look at Jesus' life, what did he do? He went to the temple? Absolutely. Paul went to the temple. He used the scriptures to reason that Jesus was the Messiah. But then he went out. Jesus Christ went out to where the people were. Just like we're called to do. Again, it's great to worship God here. We need this. I need this every week because I come depleted. I come weary. And I get to praise Jesus with you wonderful people, my family, and I walk away feeling filled again. And then I can go and I can praise Jesus throughout the week. But this isn't it. One of the best ways that we can worship God is in obedience to him. One of the best ways we can do that is by praying for one another, but also telling others about him as well. I've talked to non-Christians quite a bit, and they often tell me the issues I've had with the church. And a lot of their issues are fairly valid, and it makes sense the reason why. It doesn't mean we still can't tell them about Jesus. It doesn't mean we can't pray for them, do those sorts of things. And in doing so, we're honouring God, we're worshipping God. So we can't have this small box mentality that this is the only acceptable worship of God. 
In Matthew 5, it says the following, Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do the people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to the house. And this is Jesus' words. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Is it good to come this morning and praise God together as a people? Absolutely. Is it only acceptable between 9 and 10 o'clock? Not at all. We have a God that goes with us. We can praise God where we are. We can worship him throughout the week. And this is what Stephen was saying to the Jews. He was saying, you hold the temple up so much and yet you missed it. They were so concerned about the temple, they rejected the real temple. They rejected Jesus. And that brings me to the final point. The final big standout from Stephen's speech is the most damning one for the listeners, which is why they dragged him outside and they had him killed with stones. Because they make the point time after time after time, the Jews, the Jewish leaders, they rejected the prophets of God, therefore they rejected God. They rejected God himself time and time again. And we see that. They rejected Joseph. His brothers probably didn't realise that he would be as amazing and important as they thought, but he rejected, they rejected him. They sold him into Egypt, and yet God raised him up. Later on in verse 26, it says something similar. They rejected Moses the first time, and then Moses was the one that came back and actually redeemed the people. Initially, though, he was rejected. Who made you the ruler and judge over us? That's what was said to him. He was rejected. Verse 39. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And then we know when, when, um, when Moses was up in Mount Sinai, literally communing with God, receiving, being in the presence of God, they knew that was happening, and yet they said, we don't want any part of it. Aaron, buddy, make us a calf. Make us something that we can bow down and worship to. So the whole people rejected God again. And it keeps happening, a pattern right throughout. And then he says something that I don't recommend you saying. If you want to win friends and influence people, don't call them stiff-necked people of uncircumcised hearts and ears. Because do you know what he did? He basically called them Gentiles. I couldn't imagine anything worse than to call a proud Jew because that's what they were referred to basically as Gentiles, as unbelievers. He said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Stephen, I can't imagine it, but he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was God speaking right here. He reminds me of the Old Testament prophets of old that boldly stood up and called out the sin of the people. This is exactly what he was doing. He was calling them stiff-necked. He was saying that they were uncircumcised in heart and in ears. They rejected God. Jesus Christ was literally with them. God in the flesh and they rejected him. So God is judging them. God is calling them out. And this is what he's saying. Again, notice the tone. Stephen is the one that's accused and yet he is the accuser. Someone pointed out, and I didn't realise this, you read the speech, go home and read this speech, because it's a very long one. At the start, he says, brothers. He calls them brothers, my brothers, our family. It's very much like this. He gets to the end of his speech, and he says the opposite. He calls them Gentiles, essentially. It says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. In other words, Jesus whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Remember, Acts chapter 7 was only recently after the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Of whom you have betrayed and murdered, you received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Remember the thing? Stephen, you're going against the law. What is he saying? Well, actually, no, you're rejecting the law because Jesus Christ was the perfect fulfillment of the law and they rejected it. He is the righteous one. And he's saying again, you are like your fathers. It's a pattern of history. They rejected God. You've rejected him as well. This speech is powerful. It reminds me of that speech of Peter in Acts chapter 3, 
Remember when Peter gets up, he says, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Is it any wonder they grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and they dragged him out and they killed him? He boldly called them out on their sin. And it's tragic because when Peter gave a similar message, the people were cut to the heart. We read about the church growing. They, they, re, they repented. And yet here, later on down the track, people didn't repent. No, they gladly stoned him. It says in the next little verses, they were, weak, they were angry, they were gnashing their teeth. It's a reminder that people react differently to the gospel. People react differently. Some say, I'm sorry, I've done this. Others harden their hearts. But as I think about the modern link to this, firstly, to tell others about the gospel, we have to lovingly but boldly tell them about their sin. Lovingly and boldly, and then also straight away bring in the grace of God. People need to be aware of their need for a saviour before they need to know why they have a saviour. People need to know why they need Jesus before needing Jesus. But more than that, I was thinking about myself, because I looked at this and I went, gee, it's very easy to be proud. Those silly Jews, didn't they know that was God? Those silly Jews, didn't they forget that, you know, Moses part of the Red Sea and yet five minutes later they're whinging because they didn't have enough meat or they had too much meat or whatever? We get like that, at least if you don't, I do. But the argument is, though, every single one of us at one point has rejected God. If you're not a follower of Christ, if you're still deciding, you're still in that phase. But if you are a follower of Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, at one point you rejected God, but God in his mercy still reached down, still enabled you by faith to believe. So rather than looking at the people that reject God and think, oh, those silly people, how could they? We need to look at them with compassion and say, they need prayer. They need that prayer. We shouldn't ever give up on praying for our loved ones, those that have heard the message but reject it. Because we too were like that. If we've rejected God, we know in rejecting Jesus, we're rejecting God. We know what the punishment is. The Bible says it very clearly. This is why um, Stephen was on trial, because he boldly said, you've rejected God time and time again. And this is what he's saying here. We know that if we reject Jesus, then we're rejecting God himself. As I was thinking about these arguments here, if we have a look at this, there's the three main arguments in, in summary. And I was thinking about what we do. Because it's very easy to point out what other people do, but I think it's more important for application point to think about what do we do. We can limit the power of God by thinking God can only do certain things in certain areas. We can place too much value on the building or this gathering and forget you know what we are this is great but we're called to go out this is wonderful we need this this is god ordained but we need to go out as well we can worship god wherever we are and we need to remember that we have rejected god in the past and only by his grace and mercy can we be forgiven so i was thinking how do you close a message like this and then it came to me as we were doing our bible study because our bible study was talking about this it read through Ephesians chapter 2. And oftentimes, when I read Ephesians chapter 2, I read the first part. By grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that is good stuff. But then there's stuff at the end there as well. Reminder about what we were before. Because we are not Jews, we are Gentiles. How we were outside of God's blessing. And now because of his grace, we are inside. Because of faith in Jesus. Let me read to you in closing. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's up there. You can turn there if you want, depending on how quick you are with your Bible. But let me read to you from verse 1. And I put that image of hope there because this is a chapter of hope. It's a reminder what God has done for us and why we should celebrate. Verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, You were dead. Remember, he's addressing Christians in the Ephesian church. You were dead in trespasses and sin, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. I love those two words in the Bible. But 
God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages might show he the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. This is us too. But now in Jesus Christ, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down the flesh dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace that might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and their prophets, Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in which the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is a reminder this morning that what we were and what we are now are vitally different because of Jesus. We so easily rejected God and yet God saw in his infinite mercy to call us to himself. We can place God in a box or think that worship only happens here, but we know it can happen everywhere. And what stands out as I read that is the reality that we as a body operate together in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. This is in the, this is in the church. You and I are the church. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in us if you're a believer in Jesus. And that's worth celebrating. That's worth reminding each other about in our great times of need. And it's worth going and telling others about as well. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the, the bold witness of men like Stephen. Lord, we thank you for the reminder of your faithfulness to the people of Israel, even though time and time again they rejected you. Lord, remind us of your faithfulness towards us as we choose other things over you, as we choose other things to occupy our time instead of spending time with you. Lord, humble us, but also fill us with with a love for you, Thank you, Lord, that we can come here this morning. It is good and wonderful to worship with you. But, Lord, remind us that through our Monday to Saturday, we can worship you as well. God, help us to do that. Give us joy as we go out from here this morning. Remind us of your love for us each and every day. And thank you, Jesus, for doing what only you could do, for dying in our place and rising again so that we can be your family, that we can be your body. We commit this in your precious name. Amen.